I guess we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. Great to meet you all, although in a virtual environment. First up, thanks to all the organizers of ApacheCon for being able to organize this event despite the challenges from the pandemic. I'm Suman Pasupaleti a senior software engineer at Netflix, primarily working on persistent stores like Cassandra and caching stores like AVCache. I'm going to talk about Cassandra upgrades today. We will start by looking at what Apache Cassandra versions are available out there, what is the landscape of Cassandra at Netflix, what specific upgrade we are currently dealing with at Netflix, different upgrade validation steps we are using, and finally, the upgrade orchestration that we developed to oversee the upgrade while taking care of some of the sharp edges. Let me do a quick switch over and kick off a 3 upgrade on a 2.1 Cassandra cluster. I do not expect the upgrade to complete by end of the session, but the intention is to show you how the upgrade is performed in practice here at Netflix. I request your patience as I switch between a couple of windows here. So this is uh, the cluster that we are going to upgrade. This is a three node to one Cassandra cluster uh, spread across uh, three racks. And this tool is called Spinnaker. Uh, this is what we use for interacting with our cloud instances. And this is also our CI CD tool. Now let me kick off uh, a three upgrade on this cluster using this Jenkins job. So seems like it kicked off the pipeline. That should upgrade the cluster. Let me skip the wait. Uh, as we make progress on the talk, I'll, I'll walk you through the steps that are involved in the pipeline. But for now, uh, let me also share the terminal to see what versions of Cassandra the nodes are actually running currently on. So this script is going to run a uh, node tool version on all the three nodes of the cluster and report back the version. So as you can see, all the three nodes are running to 119. Now let me share the presentation again. So uh, before we go further, a quick basics around why and what of an upgrade. Why do we essentially uh, upgrade? Upgrades give us new features, bug fixes, security fixes, or we may need more capacity to accommodate increased load by an application. Coming to what we upgrade, in case of a software change, we may uh, upgrade operating system, Cassandra, or the sidecar. In case of a hardware change, we may be changing the instance type as an example. Let us take a quick look at what versions of Apache Cassandra are available. The minimum supported version is 2.2, followed by 3.0, 3.11, and 4.0, which is currently in beta. At Netflix, we are taking the upgrade path from 2.1 to 3.0, followed by 3.0 to 4.0. Upgrades offer applications with awesome features at each step of the upgrade. For example, 3.0 and 4.0 offer uh, some of, uh, I've listed some of the features that 3.0 and 4.0 offer. 
Now let us take a quick look at the landscape of Cassandra at Netflix. Here is a quick snapshot of state of affairs. 37% of our fleet is on 3.0, while 63% is on 2.1. The 37% 3.0 clusters not just include newly created 3.0 clusters, but also clusters that we have upgraded from 2.1 to 3.0, through which we had a lot of learnings that I'm going to share with you in the next few slides. As you can see, we are pretty heavy on 2.1 and are looking forward to shed that debt as we pave towards 3.0 which is then going to set us up well for upgrading to the most awaited version 4.0. Coming to Cassandra version upgrades, generally speaking, version upgrades are done by replacing instances or nodes that have older version of Cassandra with the ones that have newer versions of Cassandra, a rolling upgrade essentially. Cassandra being a distributed system with no concept of leaders and followers, gives us this flexibility of doing a rolling upgrade. Depending on the replication factor, which is typically three, we tend to take only one of the replicas down at a time in order to continue to be available, which is typically being able to serve local column requests. Upgrades can be broadly categorized into two kinds, major version upgrade and minor version upgrade. Minor version upgrades are typically less adventurous, less interesting, and quite straightforward. So let's talk about major version upgrades. By taking a look at some of the challenges we have with them, taking 2.1 to 3.0 upgrade as an example. Here are some of the challenges with 2.1 to 3.0 upgrade. There is no support for cross version streaming. What I mean by this is, let us say there is a 2.1 Cassandra cluster and you start upgrading the cluster to 3.0. Now during the course of the upgrade, where some nodes are on 2.1 and some nodes are on 3.0, let us say a node gets terminated. Now the replacement node may come up as 3.0, but might have its neighbors as 2.1, which, from which it will need to stream the data. In this scenario, given that there is no support for cross-streaming, uh, cross-version streaming, or in other words, since streaming protocols are not compatible between 2.1 and 3.0, the replacement node may not be able to successfully stream from the neighbors which then means it will not be able to join the ring successfully, posing availability risks. For the same reasons that streaming is not cross-version compatible, repairs may not work while the cluster is in mixed version mode as well. So it will be good to make sure you do not start the repair while upgrade is in progress to avoid doing any wasteful work. Other challenges are storage engine change. In 2.1, storage engine is script-centric, whereas in 3.0, storage engine is SQL centric. Now, this is a big change, especially for Netflix being an early adopter of Cassandra right from 0 0.7 and being on both Thrift and SQL. And so we need to validate that 3.0 is able to accommodate our 2.1 data set. If schema changes are performed during the upgrade, cluster would get into a state of schema disagreement, which means not all nodes would agree on a single schema version. This can then result in failure of operations that assume the new schema change. So it is recommended not to do any schema changes while the cluster is being upgraded. Another challenge can be with respect to features. For instance, 2.1 does not have time window compaction strategy out of the box. So we at Netflix use TWCS through Jeff Jersa jar. Now, Trio offers TWCS out of the box, so the namespace isn't exactly the same as in 2.1 jar. So we ended up writing a container class kind of a thing for 3.0 that has the same namespace as the 2.1 jar, but internally calls 3.0 TWCS. Then there are also configuration changes, which is quite common between major versions. For example, in 2.1, there is only warning threshold for batch size, whereas in 3.0, there is fail threshold. So let us say you have an application writing big batches to 2.1. Once you upgrade the cluster to 3.0, if you do not set the correct fail threshold to accommodate the application's batching criteria, the application may incur downtime, which would be pretty unfortunate. This list is not exhaustive by any means, but the intention is to give you an idea of why major version upgrades can be quite complicated. Given that we have seen how challenging major version upgrades can be, you must be wondering if we lose sleep over it. 
We do, but not because of the upgrade challenges, but because of the awesome content that Netflix has that we end up binge watching, support as a data platform team. Now let us take a quick look at what kind of validations we are doing to make sure such a major version upgrade is safe to perform. Now, there can be a bit of an overlap among these validation techniques. The goal though is to ensure all of these together to have as much coverage as possible to give us the confidence. First is the performance testing to make sure there's no regression in read or write latencies. And then correctness testing using the read path, read write path, and reading SS tables directly. By SS, reading SS tables directly, what I mean by uh, what I mean is not using the driver, but uh, using the SS table reader APIs. And finally, verifying SS table upgrade process. Before we deep dive into each one of these verifications, let us take a quick look at Cassandra ecosystem at Netflix, which we take massive advantage of for each of the verifications. For pretty much every Cassandra cluster we have at Netflix, we back up its data on a regular basis to S3. A couple of notes about our backups. They are incremental in nature in the sense, we only upload SS tables that have not already been uploaded, making them very efficient. We take full snapshots typically every six hours, which includes a flush and incrementals every 10 minutes or so. Coming back to the ecosystem, given that our backups are in S3, in addition to the highly important disaster recovery purposes, there are a couple of components that take advantage of these backups. One is we can restore the data into a different Cassandra cluster for running any tests or debugging by the application. And second is, we have a component called cast factor that reads SS tables from the S3 backup and loads them into a hive, which is then consumed by our analytical tools to produce critical analytics uh, for Netflix. Now that we've looked at what a Cassandra ecosystem looks like on a very high level, let us take a look at uh, each upgrade validation technique in detail as well. Uh, as well as any learnings uh, we've had from each of the validation techniques. First is the performance test, uh, testing. We do two kinds of validation here. We set up two different clusters, 2.1 and 3.0, and we put them under equal traffic load from NDBench. We then subject both the clusters through cycles of repairs, compactions, terminations, and compare their performance. A couple of notes about uh, NDBench. It is a benchmarking tool we developed at Netflix, which is open sourced, and we use it extensively, not just to benchmark Cassandra, but other data source as well. It's pretty easy to extend thanks to its pluggable architecture. The second kind of performance testing we do is by taking the 2.1 cluster, starting read write load against it, and then we start upgrading the cluster to 3.0. We then take a look at the latency metrics during the upgrade, as well as after the upgrade to make sure there is no uh, regression. Now coming to data verification using the read path. So let's say we have a 2.1 production cluster and its backups are present in S3. Now we restore that backup into a 2.1 test cluster created for the purpose of this validation. We then take backup of its data into S3, which we then restore to a 3.0 test cluster, again, created for this validation purpose. You may wonder why we take a backup of the 2.1 test cluster, and instead we could use uh, you know, the backup of the prod cluster and restore, for, restore to 3.0. Now, since 2.1 production cluster is receiving live traffic, there could be incrementals that keep getting uploaded, which may end up causing data differences between the 2.1 test cluster and 3.0 test cluster. Whereas using this, this technique, we, we have a good confidence that the 2.1 test cluster and the 3.0 test cluster should have exactly the same data. Then we have a, a thrift or SQL defer that essentially reads all the rows from 2.1 cluster and make sure the rows are also present in 3.0 cluster and also the, the rows match. Using this technique, we discovered an issue around lowercase column with codes. In 2.1, if you create a table 
with a column name that matches uh, to a reserved keyword. Let's say entries, and entries is a reserved keyword to, I think, index map entries. 2 one wraps that column name in quotes. Now, 2 one allows to query for that column name, even if the query does not include quotes for the column name. Now, when you upgrade the cluster to 3O, the same query would fail since it does not include the quotes, and 3O expects explicit quotes. Now, 3O behavior is, if you use any keywords in the column names, 3O would fail that request instead of wrapping it with quotes, which makes sense. In our particular situation, the application team was flexible enough to move to a different column name that does not uh, collide with any uh, uh, reserved keywords. Coming to data verification using read write path. So we use NDBench here, and as I said, it's pretty pluggable. So we wrote a new plugin to uh, verify for any corruptions during the upgrade. Now, in the write path of NDBench, it generates a random string of a pre configured length k. We UTF 8 encode it. We calculate the checksum, which is four bytes, and we append this checksum to the original value. Then we base 64 encode it and write to Cassandra. Now, on the read path of any value from Cassandra, base 64 decode it. Given that we know that the last four bytes are checksum, we extract the value and the checksum components, and then we calculate the checksum from the value component, and then we compare the calculated checksum with the checksum that we read from the data store to make sure they indeed match. If they do not match, it's, pro it's a potential sign of corruption. Now, data verification by reading SS tables. We have seen so far how we set up, uh, you know, two one test cluster and three o test cluster that should have the same data. As in, we uh, kick off SS table upgrade as part of our automation. This is to uh, aggressively convert all the two one SS tables to three o SS tables, and then we kick off a backup that backs up this three o SS table data into S three. Then we do a cast factor pool that essentially loads the 2.1 SS table data from S3 into a data frame in Hive. And then we do another cast factor pull to read the 3.0 SS tables from S3 and load them into a different data frame in Hive. And then we have a Hive differ that essentially uh, does, uh, I mean, compares the two data frames and We found two corruption issues thus far using this technique. One is resolved and one is uh, being worked upon. Let me share more details on the resolved issue. The problem was caused by the fact that SQL created dense tables had a hidden empty type column. This column is accessible through thrift and it is possible to write key value pairs to it. Now, when upgraded to 3O format, it is written as a fixed size column of size zero and whatever data this column had is also written. Now in the read path, the reader knows that the size on the column is zero, so it doesn't bother to read the bytes because it doesn't expect to have any value, and thereby it doesn't move the pointer as well. Now in the subsequent read that wants to read the next column, it will end up reading the value against the empty column instead, leading to corruption. Before we actually look at the upgrade orchestration that we've developed, let us take a quick look at how we perform different kinds of Cassandra upgrades at Netflix. We perform two kinds of upgrades, in place and out of place, which we also call replacements. We typically use in place upgrades when there is a need for software change on the instance. 2.1 to 3.0 Cassandra upgrade is a good example. On a very high level, here is the sequence of steps we perform as part of an in-place upgrade. We reboot the instance into an in-memory operating system. The in-memory operating system then downloads the new image, let's say that contains Cassandra 3.0 from S3 and writes to the root volume. We then do a second reboot of the instance to now boot into the new operating system that we downloaded to the root volume. 
you can find more details about this technique uh, using the GitHub link that I've uh, put a, put on the slide. The second kind of upgrade we do is out of place upgrades, which are useful in scenarios where there is a need for hardware change or in case of a scheduled termination of an instance. Let us take an example where we have a cluster that has nodes of type I3 extra large. Now, assuming application team is anticipating increase in load, we decide to increase the capacity on the cluster in this case by changing the instance type to say I3 4 extra large. So we launch a new instance with a new type that is I3 4 extra large. We initiate a fresh new backup on the current instance to make sure all the most recent data is uploaded into S3. We then restore that backup onto the new instance and copy any remaining delta from the current instance to the new instance that is not part of the backup. One relevant note for 3 upgrade is we had to make sure we do not perform this copy of files if the new instance to be launched is 2.1 and if the current instance is 3.0 because 2.1 cannot read 3.1 as tables. As we do the upgrade walkthrough, you'll understand why we even have this scenario. Let us take a look at some of the highlights of our Cassandra upgrade work. If you look at the code enhancements, we have patched the range streamer in Cassandra to pick and choose the same version neighbor. This is to handle the case where the neighbors are on different versions during the course of the upgrade. Also, when a new 3.0 node is launched into the cluster for the first time as part of the upgrade, we alter its replicated system key spaces from simple strategy to network topology strategy to ensure no bootstrapping issues in case of future terminations. Also, since the default partitioner has changed from random partitioner in 2.1 to murmur 3 in 3.0, we have to set it explicitly for 3.0 nodes. Coming to operational enhancements, we heavily rely on in-place upgrade technique that I mentioned earlier. Our upgrade orchestration is such that a same version neighbor is guaranteed in the course of the upgrade always. We also rely on having the flexibility to choose different Cassandra image for existing instance and a different Cassandra image for a new instance. Most importantly, we believe this upgrade technique should work just fine for future upgrades like 3.0 to 4.0. Now let us do a walkthrough of a 3 node Cassandra cluster where we upgrade it from 2.1 to 3.0. The first column indicates racks across which instances of the cluster are placed. Second column indicates version of Cassandra running on current instances of the cluster. The third column indicates it's launched in case of a termination. As you can see, we have a three node Cassandra cluster running on 2.1 with one node in each rack. And let us assume it's running with a replication factor of three. As I walk you through each upgrade step, I will also discuss different termination scenarios. And we will see how we always uh, ensure there is at least one neighbor in the same version to stream from. So the first step is to upgrade rack one. Now, let us see if, uh, if a termination happens in rack one, we end up launching a new 2.1 node that can stream from either rack two or rack three. Similarly, if a termination happens in Rack 2 or Rack 3, we end up launching a new 2.1 node that can uh, stream from either Rack 2 or Rack 3. The next step is to change the new instance version of Rack 2 and Rack 3 to 3.0. Now, if a termination happens in Rack 1, we launch a new 2.1 node that can stream from Rack 2 or Rack 3. And if a termination happens in Rack 2 or Rack 3, we launch a new 3.0 node that can stream from rack one. Now we upgrade rack two. Now again, if a termination happens in uh, rack one, we launch a new 2.1 node that can stream from rack three. And if a termination happens in rack two or rack three, we launch a 3.0 node that can stream from rack one. 
The next step is to change the new instance version of rack one to 3.0. And if a termination happens in any of the racks, rack one, rack two, or rack three, we end up launching a new 3.0 node that can stream from rack one or rack two. As a final step of the upgrade, we upgrade rack three instances to 3.0. And similar to previous scenario, any termination that happens across any of the racks, we would end up launching a new 3.0 node that can stream from rack one or rack two, or even rack three, depending on where the upgrade is on rack three. Now, before we go to the summary, let us take a quick look at the upgrade pipeline again. And, let, and I'll probably talk about a few steps that we may not have necessarily talked about in the slides. So at the beginning of the upgrade, for some of the critical clusters, we sent a notification to the application team saying, we are scheduling an upgrade within so, so much time. Uh, and we, we encourage the application team to, re, uh, to refrain from making any schema changes. Now, the application team can always come back to us saying, hey, we have a planned up, uh, schema change, and in which case we'll probably uh, reschedule the upgrade. And this is about setting the partitioner override that I was talking about because the default partitioner has changed. Here is where we upgrade the first track. Here is where we are altering the uh, replicated system key spaces to network topology strategy. Uh, this is where we are upgrading the second rack. Here is where we are changing the version that the replacement should come up with. This is the step where we upgrade rack three. And finally, once the upgrade is complete, we send an email notification again to the uh, application team saying, your Cassandra upgrade is complete. Let us also uh, take a look at the Cassandra version on the upgraded nodes. So I'm going to switch the windows again. So let us do a node tool version on the nodes. So as you can see, one instance is on 3.0 already, and two instances are 2.1 that are yet to be upgraded. Summarizing the talk, we looked at why major version upgrades can be handful, what validation we do for a major version upgrade, and we also looked at how we orchestrate an upgrade that can be applied to different kinds of upgrade, be it 2.1 to 3.0 or 3.0 to 4.0, while being resilient to terminations so long as they happen on a single rack at a time. Thank you. Now, I will look at any questions that you may have. No questions. Uh, I'm missing it, right? How specific is the S3 flash reported to S3 and AWS? Uh, to be fair, I, I don't think I have enough expertise to answer this question. Uh, a couple of uh, engineers, uh, Joey and Josh, are, have written this tool. Uh, but I would strongly look, uh, recommend uh, looking at the GitHub link uh, to get an idea.
Now, uh, so the question is, have you guys moved from uh, thrift-based drivers? Uh, so we are we are pretty thrift heavy still, but we have SQL as well. So for the SQL clusters, we are using Anius, which is a wrapper around uh, data, uh, the, the Java driver. Uh, now for thrift clusters, we use Astyanix, and uh, we are still using Astyanix thrift driver for them. I hope that answers your question. So uh, yeah, I mean we have uh, a few clusters uh, running uh, uh, ephemeral disk and a few on EBS. The next question is: Do you for the upgrade walkthrough? Do you need as many nodes as there are in the cluster to perform the upgrade in new nodes? Uh, Raymond, I'm not sure if I understand the question correct. Um, so, oh, I see. So, so uh, I think it's like how many new nodes do you need at a time uh, compared to the size of the cluster? It depends on uh, how many nodes you would want to maintain at the same time. So, uh, in our case, so we typically have our cluster across three racks and we perform uh, the upgrade at uh, one rack at a time. And we, uh, in production, we are currently uh, maintaining or doing a parallel upgrade on two nodes at a time in a single rack. So we will need, in that case, we will need two new nodes uh, at most at the same time. So the higher the parallelism uh, you do the upgrade, the higher the number of new nodes that you will need. So So uh, Paul's question is, no new nodes for out of place upgrade, sorry, new nodes for out of place upgrade and no new nodes for in place upgrade. That's correct. So uh, we do not launch new nodes for in place upgrade. So we expect uh, almost like high 90% of the upgrade uh, to 3.0 to happen without requiring new nodes uh, because we do in place upgrade and that's the fastest because we don't lose data. Uh, it's only in case of a termination uh, that we will end up launching new nodes. And even for that, as, a, as I've shown, uh, we try to uh, leverage uh, S3 as much as possible for fast data transfer. While I wait for, okay, while I wait for new questions, uh, I think for the benefit of the talk, I should probably repeat uh, Joey's answer to one of the questions. So the question was, uh, how specific is S3 flash bootloader to S3 and AWS? Joey responded that the technique is general, the implementation is specific. It's basically a live CD that can boot from a blob store.
how do you ensure that someone doesn't so dinesh is asking how do you ensure that someone uh, doesn't accidentally boot a malicious image so we have a uh, pretty uh, tight uh, s3 boundaries uh, in fact uh, we ensure that uh, every cassandra cluster has its own instance profile so uh, so s3 itself uh, has very tight boundaries and the cluster is also uh, pretty bounded in terms of uh, what s3 it can access so uh, we have that way we have pretty good control on uh, what we have in s3 if that answers your question. I think we have four minutes more before the next session starts. So Any other questions? All right, I assume there are no more questions. Uh, so thank you.